I can never tell when we're on. I'm assuming we're, we're on. Right. We are on. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Thursday night with the Cape MD. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I am Dr. Kristen. We have Dr. Tamika, Dr. Amber, and Dr. Lakeisha. We are the Cape MD tonight. I um, it's my honor to introduce you all to our special guest, um, Dr. Daryl Gray. Um, is joining us this evening. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Daryl. Um, let me tell you a little bit about him because he has a lot of accolades. He's doing so many amazing things. Um, Dr. Daryl, like myself, graduated from the Howard University College of Medicine. Um, and he is now the an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology at The Ohio State University. Um, he has numerous honors. Um, he's been doing so much work in the community. Um, he was inducted into the 2017 class of the National Minority Quality Forum, 40 Under 40 Leaders in Health. Um, and also um, he has received a National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable National Achievement Award. Um, he's originally from Baltimore, Maryland. He graduated from Morehouse College and as I said, went on to Howard University for medical school. Um, he did his residency at Duke University. Um, I mean, he has just really been that doing black it. Magic, that black magic. Definitely. <laughs> that 4%. That 4%. <laughs> All right now. So, Dr. Darrell, thank you so much for joining us this evening. So glad to be here. Thank you all for having me. I'm excited. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, tonight, everyone, um, we just wanted to um, take some time and really talk about colon cancer or colorectal cancer. Um, for most of us out there, we all know that um, unfortunately, we lost one of our own real life superheroes um, just a few weeks ago, Chadwick Boseman, um, who I believe was only 43 years old, mm -hmm. um, passed away from colon cancer. So it really, made us want to do a show dedicated specifically um, to bringing more awareness so that we can better prevent it. Um, so I know for me and for, I would say the world, specifically the black community, you know, I think this, this loss really hit hard. Um, why do y'all, why do y'all think that is? I mean, 2000 or yeah, what are we in 2020? I mean, we've lost so many amazing human beings this year, but this one was really rough. I think that for me, especially being someone who's really into superheroes, as you guys can see, I have my um, Howard brother on there, Mr. Chadwick Boseman, who played, um, uh, we have, we're twins, um, who played Black Panther. It was, it was amazing to see an African-American male in a leading role as a hero. You know, we see so many negative images of our African-American men that this was special for me. And so for, for me to go from showing my kids, like you can be a hero, you can be Black Panther to watching him pass away, but not only pass away, but pass away with grace. You know what I mean? Um, you know, he never complained. He never told people, hey, I want you to feel sorry for me. And so that was, it was hard for me. I'm not gonna lie. I have spent many a night, you know, reading over like all the things he's done for the community, all the things he did, you know, for others and crying, just thinking about what we lost, mm -hmm. you know? And so some people can give so much in the little time that they're here. 43 years is not long, but he gave so much of himself to us. That I think it's our mission, you know, I'm going to make it my mission to make sure all of my patients, especially my males who don't want to get screened, make sure they get screened. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to get started. We have lots of questions for Dr. Darrell. This, he is the expert in this field, so we want to give him all the time we can, but we thought it would be fun just to start 
with a short little poll for um, all of our viewers out there, because I know as I was you know, gathering information for tonight, I realized that everything that we learned in med school um, doesn't necessarily apply anymore. Um, so I was curious to see how much you all know about how to best prevent and screen for colon cancer. So I'm just gonna put a couple quick questions up here. I promise this is not a, it's not a quiz, won't be graded, um, but just kind of wanted to get a feel for um, from you all to see kind of, you know, what you guys already know about colon cancer. So um, for an adult that has an average risk for colon cancer, meaning they don't have a family history of it, they don't have any increased risk factors, at what age should you get your first colonoscopy? Is it at 60 years old, 45 years old, 55 or 50 years old? And feel free to drop a comment if you think you know the answer. Again, you know, we're not grading it, I promise. Uh, <laughs> but just let us know what you think. So I'll keep that up for a few more seconds. And that one's a little tricky, Kristen. We'll come back to that. I know. Also, right. also, right. know. It's a little tricky. <laughs> so a lot I'm of people are saying D. Yeah. D is North definitely North. The, the leader in the pack right now. Okay. I've got a couple of Bs. Participate. So for you North Carolina natives or Charlotteans, the incentive is whomever from Charlotte can answer the question first will get a free IV hydration and nutrition um, service at Elevate MD Wellness Center. Oh, That's the incentive. All right, man. Like that. Package, yo. For okay. the first and second question, you have to get them both right. <laughs> Tricky. All right, everybody have a chance to answer question number one. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot. I'm seeing like 50% B, 50% D. Okay, awesome. All right, let's go on to question number two. If I can get this thing to do that. Okay. Um, so how often, again, we're talking about someone who does not have a history of polyps or family history an average person with average risk, how often should you go get a screening colonoscopy? Every year, every two years, every five years, or every 10 years? Sorry, that should say A, B, C, D. Y'all just pretend like it says A, B, C, D. A lot of people coming to Charlotte, I'm just going to say, some people are going to Charlotte for heavy hydration, bro. <laughs> Show proof of residence. <laughs> I'm, saying, I'm seeing a lot of number fours. I'm tampered utility bill with your name and your address on it. <laughs> she trying to be the government. <laughs> All right, I think I think that's good. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I'm sure we're going to get to the, the answers to both of those questions as we chat with Dr. Daryl. Um, so let me um, stop sharing the screen real quick. Okay. So, um, Dr. Daryl, um, let's start with. Let's just talk about. Um, how colon cancer affects different communities. Um, you know, we do see a lot of disparities in healthcare, you know, across the board, but in your practice or in any statistics or studies that you know of, um, does colon cancer disproportionately affect communities of color? Um, is it more prevalent in one gender than another? Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So um, colorectal cancer, which really encompasses colon and rectal cancer together, the colon being your large intestine, the rectum being kind of the reservoir uh, for stool right before it exits. Um, colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related death. And unfortunately, it disproportionately impacts Black and Indigenous people of color, particularly African Americans. We have the highest number of cases per year and the highest death rate per year. Now, on average, uh, just in general, encompassing everybody, there are about 100 
and 50,000 new cases of colorectal cancer a year and about 50,000 people die. So a third uh, die. Uh, but African-Americans um, over and above other populations have the highest uh, incidence and, and death rates. And this is for men and women. So it impacts you know, men and women. You know, it's not something that's isolated to women. It's not something that's isolated to men. It affects both populations. And you know, it's, it's, it's not just because of the skin color that makes you at higher risk uh, for getting a case or dying from it. We all know that um, there are other factors that play a role in it, such as people's access to healthcare, getting screened, um, lifestyle habits such as diet and exercise and things like that that also play a role and I'm sure we'll dig into that as well. Yeah, definitely. So um, let's just say that I am someone who doesn't have any risk factors for mm -hmm. colon, for colorectal cancer. Um, at what age should I start getting screening colonoscopies? All right, so this is where it got tricky for question mm -hmm. number one, okay. Um, because the United States Preventive Services Task Force, so just to put it plainly, this is a, um, a task force that generates the guidelines that insurers tend to follow when they approve you getting screened, for example. Um, they have said for a very long time that you should start at age 50, and they still do. And they're supposed to meet, I think, later this year to consider revising that. However, and this is why I think the people who answered 45 and 50 are both right, uh, because the American Cancer Society recommended, this is over a year ago, pr probably about a year and a half ago, recommended that all average risk individuals start at age 45. Wow. In addition to that, African Americans, even before a year and a half ago, the American Cancer Society said it, in 2007, and then again in 2017, the American College of Gastroenterology and the United States Multi-Society Task Force said African-Americans, knowing that we get diagnosed with uh, later stage disease at an earlier age, should start at age 45. So I have traditionally been recommending all of my African-American patients start at age 45. And if I get any pushback from insurers, I usually will kind of present them with the guidelines and have a peer-to-peer -peer discussion. Um, so that's why I would say both 45 and 50, because the United States Preventive Services Task Force still says 50. Uh, but a lot of us are recommending 45. Great. Um, that's really good um, information because I still thought it was 50. Mm -hmm. um, and when I realized that, like you said, American Cancer Society over a year ago had recommended 45, I just wanted to make sure that people were aware of that. Um, mm -hmm. Because you may be 46 thinking that you had another four years, but mm -hmm. next time you go see your primary care doctor, you should probably say, hey, time for my screening colonoscopy. That's right. And, right. Hey, and there's still some doctors. I mean, there's still some doctors, you know, there's still a lot of primary care doctors who don't necessarily, you know, know that they can start recommending at age 45. And so, you know, you coming in as the patient saying that, uh, you might educate them. So, yeah. True. Absolutely. And so, I think it's, you said something really important, which was, um, you know, there are opportunities if insurance, um, does not um, authorize the procedure that there is um, another avenue um, that your physician can take, which is speaking to a physician representative at the insurance company, this peer-to-peer -peer conversation mm -hmm. to um, request review, especially if you are um, a Black American. Absolutely. No, you definitely have to be an advocate, not only on the patient side, you have to be an advocate for yourself, but also know that you have a healthcare provider that's advocating for you as well. So that's important. Yeah. Right. So if I am a patient who knows it's time for me to get a colonoscopy, how do I go about doing that? Do I need to go see my primary care physician first? Do I need to search for GI specialists like yourself in my area? What, what are my first steps? Well, you have multiple options. Um, you could, uh, one option is you might not even need to see your primary care doctor. You could honestly, many, many um, practices have web portals. Ours at Ohio State is called MyChart, but it's a way you can send your doctor a message, almost like an email um, and communicating. Maybe you're sending them a message because you need a refill on a medication or something like that. But you could easily just say, hey, can I get a referral uh, to get my screening colonoscopy? And a lot of times 
that can just be a direct access referral. When I say direct access, that means that you can go straight from that referral to then getting your colonoscopy. You don't necessarily have to go see a gastroenterologist in clinic before you get the colonoscopy. You can go straight refer directly to ultimately getting the colonoscopy. Um, but I would say that the first step should be talking with or sending a, a note to um, your primary care doctor. You don't necessarily need to wait to get into a specialist like a gastroenterologist's office because that wait may be quite long. Unfortunately, um, gastro gastroenterologists are in high demand. And so our wait times can be quite long to get into clinic, unfortunately. So um, but know that you don't have to wait to get a new appointment to be seen in clinic. You can get a procedure without that. Mm -hmm. That's good information because that'll ultimately save the patient time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like we know, if, you know, you happen to have a polyp or something that is um, a risk for colon cancer, the earlier that we detect it, the better your chances are. Right, Dr. Darrell? Absolutely. So, you know, our goal with screening is to really interrupt the cycle between when you have an abnormal cell that might turn into a polyp, try to capture it then as opposed to when it turns to cancer. And if we do, by chance, catch a early, uh, cancer, hopefully it's at an early stage because greater than 90 percent of early stage colon cancers can be cured. And so we, we use colonoscopy as a great tool that allows us to look through the entire colon. And if I see a, the smallest of defects, the smallest of polyps, even one hiding behind a fold, fold I'd like to remove it. Uh, the challenge is that um, now there are other options that you have for screening, but that is the best test to allow us to identify small polyps and look throughout the entire colon for them. And I'm glad you have the other screening options. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Amber. Well, I was just saying we've got some we've got some follow up questions. Um, you know, there is this um, you know fear, hesitancy, especially amongst um, Black males about um, going to the doctor, let alone going for a colonoscopy. And there have been actors or celebrities um, who I think have tried to. Um, you know, have tried to use their positions to influence um, Black males to get um, early screening. I, I'm thinking of Will Smith, who mm -hmm. um, did something. Um, I don't know how much of the colonoscopy was showed. I don't, I don't remember the details, yeah. but I do know that he shared his journey in deciding to get his colonoscopy. So mm -hmm. one of the questions is, you know, how do we, how do we um, in, uh, encourage especially black males to get this screening and to get this screening at age 45. Yeah, I, I think part of it is, is we have to do a better job of just communicating in a way that resonates with them. I think Will Smith, to your point, did a great job. He, he made a vlog of his experience and kind of talked with his, uh, the concierge doctor he worked with, Dr. Ayla Stanford, um, mm -hmm. about his experience. And I think that's, that's much needed. I think there also needs to be um, more of us uh, as, as women and men of color putting the message uh, out there to our communities and because it's, it's our voice that, that in many cases is trusted over other voices and so we have to be very visible uh, and heard in regards to that. And I think too, um, our ladies and our partners can, can help us in this, in this journey. I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many times I see men in the clinic and it's because their wife uh, brought them in, um, pulling them by their ears because they've been dealing with something for a long time that they didn't want to see anybody about. So I think, you know, we have to leverage, you know, trusted brokers in our community, whether they're, you know, physicians that we trust in the community, whether it's, you know, our churches, whether it's, you know, we, community health workers, liaisons. Um, uh, we have to leverage these trusted brokers in our community to really get the message out there in a way that resonates uh, with our folks. So. Yeah. Absolutely. I have a question. Can you just kind of um, talk to me as if I know absolutely nothing, like what are average risk? Um, I didn't, you know, let's just say someone reading the questions in the poll didn't even know what risk were and what are polyps and where do they come from and how do you get colon cancer? And just kind of talk to the viewers like we don't know anything. Oh, sure. I'm happy to. So, um, when we say average risk, that really means that um, number one, 
you don't have a family member, a particularly a first degree relative, which we refer to as a mom, dad, brother, or sister who has or had colon or rectal cancer. Um, so that's one kind of qualification. And um, because those things that can increase your risk. Um, the, the other thing is that you personally have not had a history of, can of colon cancer or rectal cancer or colon polyps. So really with those two um, factors, you would be at average risk. Now there's some caveats too. Uh, some people have what's called inflammatory bowel disease. You may have heard of Crohn's disease right. or ulcerative colitis. These are diseases that can cause um, long-standing inflammation in the colon. And as a result of that inflammation, it can cause cancer uh, over time. And so that would increase your risk too. So that's, that's one piece, right? And then the other piece is, um, I think, touching on kind of signs and symptoms you know, you may not have any sign or symptom whatsoever. And that's what makes screening so important. We don't want to wait until you have blood in your stool to see a doctor or to get screened because by then it might be too late. Now, certainly blood in your stool is something to seek professional help about. Don't assume that it's just a hemorrhoid. Um, it may be a sign of something more serious. Other things that can be signs are abdominal pain, losing weight, not meaning to, um, change in your stool caliber from being kind of regular to more thin, pencil thin is kind of a buzzword for that. Um, but um, you may not have those symptoms. So if you are over the screening age and you're like, doc, I've been great, I eat, I run, I, you know, I drink green smoothies, I don't think I need uh, you know, to get screened. I'll tell you, no, you still need to get screened um, because you may have something you just never know that it's there. And the, the purpose is trying to, again, interrupt that cycle from a little growth like a polyp, like what we said, where it's kind of an abnormal growth of cells. It can look, um, they can change in, in how it looks. It can look like a little eraser tip. It can look like a little mushroom inside of the colon. Um, and, you know, if I see that, I'm going to remove it. But if you never come in for a colonoscopy, you never get tested, it can just continue to grow and grow and grow until it then becomes a cancer. And that cancer may choose not to just stay in your colon. It may choose to say, hey, let me see what this liver is talking about. Let me see what these lungs are talking about. Let me see what that brain's talking about. And so it may spread to those other organs. We call that metastatic colon cancer once it's spread. And that's what we try to avoid. That was excellent. Thank you so much. That's yes, awesome. great information. So speaking mm -hmm. of that, you know, we had another question and, and this is what I get a lot. So um, I don't take new patients anymore, but I've, you know, the last year I did take a new patient, it was someone who was having some of those symptoms that you were talking about. And she was, of course, young, um, younger than 40 and um, was coming in and was like, I'm having these symptoms and no one's taking me seriously. And I was like, okay, well, we're gonna work you up and we're gonna make sure we figure out what's going on. And she had stage four colon cancer uh -huh. Um, and it had been going on a year. And so from a patient, from one of the viewers, they said, you know, how do you advocate for yourself? How do you put yourself out there to say, hey, I'm having these symptoms and I, I need to be checked out now? Because well, you know, as we know, Chad, Chadwick Bozeman, Bozeman had it, he passed away at 43 and he had it yeah. years before this. So he had it before that 45. Yeah. That was in 2016. So what's that? No. You know, as I said, I, you know, I, I honestly have not been privy to the details of his medical history and family history and that kind of thing. So I'm not, you know, I don't know um, what kind of, what that history looked like from the time of his diagnosis and what else could have played into that. But for particularly like your patient who said nobody was taking her seriously, you know, know that you have a right to a second opinion. You have a right to a third opinion, maybe even a fourth opinion. And trust, you know, I, I am at my practice is in an academic medical center. In most cases, I'm seeing people for a second or third opinion because they've seen, you know, a provider in the community and then want to get another opinion. Um, so, you know, know that you have that right um, to get a second and third opinion if you feel like you're not taken seriously. And I encourage people to, to advocate for that. You know, a lot of times we sit in the doctor's office and we nod and, you know, we say, okay, um, and we're not happy and just continue to go back to that practice. Um, but you have, you know, you have a right to change practices if you want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's no loyalty in medicine when it comes to <laughs> loyalty to yourself and your health. Yeah. Right. Um, so, Dr. Darrell, I know one question I had not actually wanted to ask you too, Dr. Tamika, since you um, are a family physician. 
um, if your patient came to you and instead of wanting to get a colonoscopy, they wanted to get one of those take home kits. I'm not really sure how that works, but is that something that you both recommend to your patients? Um, is it as good of a screening tool as colonoscopies? Well, I think, thank you for that question. I think, you know, certainly if we're going to do due diligence by our patients, we should offer them options, you know, so to help with the shared decision making. So yes, it's important that we offer, you know, the slew of options that we have from stool-based testing uh, to even CT colonography to colonoscopy. And when I say CT colonography, it's a CT scan that looks for polyps, basically. Um, the challenge with both the stool-based tests and the, the CT scan, for example, is that if an abnormality is fine, so f found, excuse me, so if you f have an abnormal stool test, like a FIT test, uh, which is where you're testing the stool for blood, or FIT DNA, also called Cologuard, that's abnormal, a test for blood and DNA. If that's abnormal, the next step is to get a colonoscopy, okay? Mm -hmm. So you know um, that if you're going into your doctor's office saying there's no way I'm getting a colonoscopy, well, I may have to reconsider if I'm even offering your stool test because we know that if it's abnormal, your, your screening is not complete until you finish that colonoscopy for the abnormal um, stool-based test. Now, the stool-based tests are great at detecting cancer. They're less than great at detecting polyps. Um, they are designed to look for blood and, and in the case of Cologuard for abnormal DNA. Now, that's not to say that when I'm doing colonoscopies, because someone has had an abnormal um, fit test or an abnormal um, Cologuard test that, that, that I, I don't find polyps. I do. So there are cases where they have an abnormality and it's not cancer, it's just polyps that I ended up, that I end up removing. So they can and they have detected polyps. But um, colonoscopy is best at looking for small polyps that might not be releasing blood or abnormal DNA that allows us to remove them um, at the time of the procedure. So I'm glad you brought up that there are some people out there that are just like, I'm not having a colonoscopy in the story. I mean, even as an anesthesiologist, um, sometimes when I'm explaining sedation to patients, I'll say, oh, it's just like when you had your colonoscopy and they'll be like, no, I've never had it. <laughs> 70. And I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> but, um, and Dr. Lakeisha, maybe you can chime in on this too. Um, what can we tell patients in terms of what they can expect um, getting a colonoscopy, because I think just the idea of what the procedure is, and, you know, some people may not even fully understand what the procedure is, so we might want to, you know, tell them a little bit more about that, too, but in terms of how comfortable they will be, you know, some people don't realize that you could have um, a colonoscopy with just a little bit of IV sedation administered by a nurse, or you could have, you um, an anesthesia team, whether it be an anesthesiologist or a nurse anesthetist, actually administer deeper sedation to where you literally just sleep throughout the procedure. So, you know, maybe if we tell them a little bit more about that, it'll maybe put their mind at ease a little bit that, okay, this isn't going to be torture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry, Dr. Lakeisha. No, I, I'm going to leave the procedure to you because okay. we often joke in gastroenterology suites, I stay at the head and the front, uh, and the base down and the back, I just give that over to you. <laughs> um, and, well, okay, so in terms of comfortability, so um, I'm looking right at all of my viewers, particularly my minority viewers. Listen, uh, if you're a mama, you can get a colonoscopy. If you have grown an entire human being in your stomach, you can have a colonoscopy. Why? Because it's a piece of cake in comparison to childbirth, okay? If you are a male, all right, you don't have any idea about labor pains or having a baby. So I have no analogy for you other than to say, you can be completely asleep and unaware of the procedure itself. The worst part of the day is actually having the IV place, which if you've had a flu shot or a TB shot or any type of blood draw, the IV placement is analogous to that. 
couple of seconds of uncomfortableness, the IV is in. And that is our conduit for which myself, Dr. Amber and Dr. Kristen administer medication, mostly called propofol, um, which will just put you into what some layman people or common people know as twilight sleep and what we call deep sedation. Um, most people wake up asking, have we even started yet? Another form of sedation is um, called IV sedation by a nurse. So a nurse who is not a nurse anesthetist can give you high dose pain medication and something called um, Versed, or perhaps they give you Ativan to take before you come or Valium to take before you come. That family medications is called benzodiazepines and basically they reduce stress. So they make you comfortable and they also make you sleepy. So that in combination with pain medication is also a route. Um, with that, there is a possibility that you might be aware of the procedure, which for some people is totally fine. Um, but for others, they're like, nope, put me completely out. In that case, you want to ask for an anesthesia team or provider who can give you deep sedation. Yes, it's the white milk or the Michael Jackson drug, but that's a whole nother episode that we'll get into because although I love me some MJ, he didn't make the best decision regarding that. <laughs> yeah. One of our, I, I, one I of our viewers says he wants to be um, out like a light. Yes. <laughs> that, in that case, you want an anesthesia provider, a CRNA or an anesthesiologist. <laughs> right. No, that's that, those are all great points. Um, I think the main takeaway is, you know, regardless of the type of sedation you get, whether it's conscious sedation, meaning you get the Versed um, and the fentanyl, um, or you get the um, uh, deep sedation with the monitor anesthesia care or the propofol, you know, either way, most of the times you're you're completely sleep. I mean, definitely guaranteed if you get the propofol, you're completely out. Um, with fentanyl and Versed. Um, which I actually use mostly in, in my practice. I do both MAT cases or monitor anesthesia cases with pro propofol and conscious sedation cases. And, and the overwhelming majority of time that I'm doing conscious sedation cases, um, and folks wake up and like, did you even start yet? You know, they're, they're not awake. Um, and yeah, it's a good experience. I think the, the, the main thing that people complain about is the day before the bio prep, as they take bio prep the day before, maybe even sometimes the morning of as well. Um, that's the biggest complaint um, of the experience is that, um, but the procedure, you know, for it, it should not be a painful procedure um, at all. And, 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 and usually it's a quick procedure. The longest time it takes is you getting checked in, getting your IV, getting dressed. Uh, the procedure itself takes about 15 and 20 minutes for me to do, um, depending on what I find. Um, so, yeah. Any young scientists out there that can make that prep taste like a strawberry? Yeah, prep? you'll be a billionaire. In the next yeah. two years, because I'm 45 in two years. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you'll be <laughs> so one of, we've got a, um, several really um, great questions from the viewers. Um, and with regards to the procedure um, and kind of the after um, care, what, what to expect? You know, how long um, um, before you um you know are kind of back to your normal stuff after the procedure and i would you know say say from an anesthesia standpoint it all depends on the level of sedation that you're getting so whether you get um you know the pain medicine and the benzodiazepine as dr lakeisha explained earlier or whether you have um deep um a deeper sedation with propofol will depend on your recovery time. I always tell my um, patients, um, regardless of the spectrum of which they're receiving anesthesia for the procedure, um, that, you know, don't plan on making any important decisions today. You know, if you're going to your attorney, this is not the day to go to your attorney and sign important paperwork. You plan on getting divorced today, not, not today, tomorrow, after these drugs wear, um, wear off. So and don't get on social media either. Yeah, don't get on social That's media. Trouble. Propofol and Versed have you saying some, you know, things that you may not want to put out there in the streets. So, you know, waiting until the next day to make important decisions and just plan on taking it easy after the procedure and not um, not driving um, after the procedure, regardless of the spectrum of, of drugs that you're receiving that day. 
Dr. Tamika, as someone who has had a colonoscopy before, do you want to give a perspective from the patient's point of view? So, you know, um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I, you know, I had a colonoscopy at uh, 35. Um, my grandmother had colon cancer and my aunt had ovarian cancer. So I'm at a higher risk. I was having some GI issues and decided it was time to get a colon, you know, a colonoscopy. And um, I will say, honestly, it was the right decision for me. My aunts all had polyps. Um, I wanted to be screened early and I was having, I was already having issues. And so I do not regret the decision. I thought the prep wasn't that bad, honestly. Um, they have changed, um, as Dr. Darrell will probably tell you, it's not the big jug you normally get, you know, when people always say, oh, I got this big jug of juice and it was awful. It's, it's Gatorade and Miralax. I mean, mostly, I mean, so it's, it's easy. It, it, you know, you're going to poop water at some point. So it, not the best, but it's doable. And, and for me, the propofol sleep, I'm sorry, y'all, was the best sleep I've ever had in my life. I woke up like, oh, God. I sleep for 24 hours. I sleep for 10 minutes, probably. But in all honesty, it was pretty easy. The procedure in and of itself, I do not remember. Um, and I'm glad I did it. And so when I tell patients, it's easier to come from that perspective and say, hey, I've, I've done it. Like, I've been there. I know that that prep isn't the best. It's not, you're not going to love it. But it's not also the worst thing that I've ever gone through in my life. And especially for my male patients, I especially say that. And, you know, Dr. Darrell kind of talked about like Culligar and fit test. And um, I had talked to Dr. Kristen earlier about, yeah, you know, those are great screening tools if you don't want to have a colonoscopy to start off with. But if you have risk factors like me, I'm, I was already having symptoms um, and I have a huge family history that puts me at increased risk. Color guard and fit test may not be the best option for me. Um, and, and so I now tell the patient, you know, I'll be honest with you, this may not be the best option for you. You, I would prefer if you went ahead and got your colonoscopy instead of color guard and fit because of your risk factors. And, you know, I'm pretty honest with them. And I'm like, you know, I'm just like Dr. Darrell, you know, this is a screening test that could 90% of the time cure you. Um, that's an amazing cure rate. And so if I can cure you rather than treat you, that is what I would prefer to do. Yeah. It's worth the temporary uh, uncomfortableness of drinking a liquid that could taste better, um, but the benefit completely, completely a bajillion full outweighs, you know, drinking something nasty. Just do old school, pinch your nose and take a bath. <laughs> and don't cheat on it either because if you don't finish your prep or if your bowels are not clear by the time you arrive for your colonoscopy they may have to cancel you and you may have to do it again do it all so over again you want to just do it once you don't want to have to do it again so don't cheat on your prep <laughs> that's right <laughs> so we've got um we've got a couple of um a couple of more questions um um with regards to aftercare. And so there's a question, you know, is, is there any um, point that you would use stitches or there would be something more? Um, so I guess a, a good, a good um, follow-up question to that is if you have to remove a sizable polyp um, from the colon during the um, colonoscopy, um, are there stitches involved? What, what would you, what would, what would the aftercare look like for that? Uh, it's really, yes, I appreciate that question. It's really no aftercare. Um, so, you know, even with very large polyps, um, you know, we don't have to put, put stitches inside the colon. Um, on some occasions, if we're concerned about bleeding, um, which is not common, even for large polyps, um, we will um, put what we call hemoclips on over the area where we remove the polyp. What that means is it's kind of like a clothespin, a very tiny clothespin, like what you would, you know, we used to use to hang up our laundry outside, for example, uh, on the on the clothesline. Mm -hmm. You can use these little pins to close up a, a defect that's created by us cutting off the polyp. And um, we use different tools to, to remove polyps. If they're very, very tiny, we can use forceps to just kind of snip them off. If they're a little bit larger, we use um, almost like a lasso. Um, we call it a snare. So it's kind of like you might think of somebody lassoing 
um, a horse or something, we can lasso um, a polyp and kind of just cut it off. And usually there's no bleeding uh, when that happens. Occasionally, if it's a very large polyp uh, that we have to remove, then there may be a little bleeding, but we could stop it with one of those hemo clips. And there's no real aftercare that's required. Yeah. So there was another question and it was um, about colon cancer being hereditary in other cancers that if you have a family history of other cancers, is that to make you at increased risk of colon cancer? Well, there are some um, familial, meaning running in the family um, syndromes that can involve multiple cancers. And generally that centers around breast and ovarian and that um, there's some syndromes that people can have that where it's tied to colon cancer, but it's important, you know, um, that you just chat with your doctor about what your personal medical history is. And that's why it's also important that you share your family history with your family. Um, I have a friend um, who was a stage four colon cancer survivor, and she says family secrets kills families. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's uh, important. Dr. Carroll, say it again for the people. Yeah, we don't, you know, family secrets can can kill families. So we can't keep secrets and we got to share our family so the folks, you know, know that they need to be screened and they're at higher risk. Um, so that's profound. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's really important that you talk to your doctor, but also talk to your own family. Yeah. yeah. And so speaking from my own personal experience, you know, my grandmother, of course, had colon cancer, but my, my aunt had ovarian cancer, which put me at like, like, if you put the numbers in is like, twice, I'm twice as likely to get one or the other. And so for me, it was really important to, when I was having those symptoms to go ahead and get screened. Yeah. And culturally, you know, I just want to harp on a little bit about that profound statement that Dr. Daryl just said. Culturally, we are known to keep a secret. Mm -hmm. I mean, you will have, you know, a secret that'll come out after somebody is six feet below the ground. Like Dr. Daryl said, if there's something health related that could possibly have genetic links, there's no need to keep a secret because like Dr. Daryl said, secrets can kill families. So if it's health related, just say it. And when you're listening, don't pass judgment, just listen, just, just receive the information, no judgment pass. Yeah. Well, this has all been such good information um, and we do still have to figure out if somebody's coming to Charlotte to get that free IV. <laughs> so we got we got to tell the people to answer to question number two. Dr. Daryl, you want to take that one for what, us? What was it? Tell me what the question was again. I'm sorry. <laughs> again, for someone with average risk, so no family history, yeah. no previous. Oh, how often? Yes, that, that was every 10 years. Yeah. Every 10 years was the answer to that one. Yeah. And then just to revisit for our viewers who are joining in later, i.e. my husband. I um, saw him come in. All right, yeah. right. So yeah. I'm Welcome. Special guest, the other Dr. Brooks. Um, you know, <laughs> just to just to reiterate for the, the newer um, recommendations say that you should get your colonoscopy at 45, boo. So we'll be dragging you in there pretty soon. <laughs> we there. There, <laughs> he's gonna drag you in there soon. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can you can make a trip to Columbus, Ohio. I got you. It's it's all good. <laughs> we got somebody for you, Mike. <laughs> and it's a Warhouse brother, so Mike also went to Warhouse. Yes. Okay, there we go. <laughs> yes, he because he, he may not listen to me, but he may listen to his Morehouse brother. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, so I don't know. Somebody's booking a nonstop flight to uh, Charlotte. I'm just going to put that on. <laughs> well, I want to make good on my incentivization. So how do we figure yeah. out who got both answers correct? I will have to look uh, through it and see. Okay. So do we take some time. if they want? Huh? D oh wait, where is this? What what platform? D they can they can message us if they have both questions. Okay, so if they have, have both, both questions right and they have to live in Charlotte I'm with a valid ID. <laughs> I'm not talking about Huntersville, I'm talking Charlotte. Okay. <laughs> both questions right, Charlotte. 
Good luck with that. I might have to come check out Charlotte too one of these days. I have, I have family in, in Durham. So you're only what, a couple hours yeah. away? Is it two hours away from Durham and Charlotte? Right. And then, okay, listen, we're, this is not our first rodeo, y'all. So I need y'all to also take a screenshot right now with the date and the time. Because I know tomorrow some people can watch the show and they can be like, yeah, I seen it. No, uh uh. Take a picture right now, <laughs> time stamp, and submit that to us on our Facebook page. Just message us with the picture. Say, I got both answers right, and I live in Charlotte. And bam, you in there. And like swimwear. Yep. <laughs> well, we have, a, we have another um, comment from one of our viewers, and um, I appreciate um, her sharing this. And she says, you know, I love this discussion. My grandfather, my grandfather had colon cancer. And by the way, my grandfather um, passed away from colon cancer as well. Um, and it says, but um, this particular person says he kept it a secret. My dad had liver cancer. Thank you all for sharing this information. So, you know, wow. information is power mm -hmm. um, and information um, shared openly with others um, saves lives. And that is part of our hope um, for creating this platform. Um, this isn't about us. This is about, um, you know, our community and empowering our community and um, giving them tools that they can, practical tools that they can take back to um, their physician and advocate on, on their behalf. That's right. So Dr. Darrell, I want to thank you so much for coming to us tonight. We will bring you back. You were awesome. Oh, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. I had fun with you all, especially when I get to be with my sisters and Spellman sister, especially and Howard sister too. So, so thank you all. You were all a fantastic, um, really appreciate being on the, with you all. And if you guys want to see Dr. Farrell, go to the Ohio State University. He is there. <laughs> um, Mike, you headed there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing him, maybe dragging and screaming, but I'm, I'm bringing him. <laughs> not Dr. getting involved in that. Dr. Um, Dr. Ambu, I think I might have let a cat out the bag, a little family secret. But anyway, uh, I guess we just we just chop chop liver. We ain't going to HBCU. Oh no, nah, no, nah, I, I said sisters. I got love for all y'all. Come on, nah. That's right, I, I went to love this all. too. I was just I was okay, in I Northwestern, so <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, it's all but good. On a serious note, before we end, we, we did this show to educate y'all, but also to pay homage to uh, the late, great chat with Bossman, Bozeman, sorry. And um, if I could leave our audience with one thing, I think the thing that hurt uh, a lot of us the most is that we had no idea. And so I want to use his life as an illustration to all of you that you may think you know someone's story, but you have absolutely no idea. And if you look at him and you honor him as the Black Panther and Wakanda forever, then I want you to also honor him as a pillar of strength and as a pillar of courage, because in spite of what he was going through like a champion, he showed up and showed out on screen. Little did we know what he had been dealing with since 2016. So no matter what you're facing in your life, okay, even if you're facing death, you can still dig, you can still dive deep and um, show up because um, you just never know who you might bless. And unbeknownst to him, the world was watching and we all were inspired by his life. So um, bad days don't last forever. And if they do still live your life as though Everybody's watching. Wakanda forever, y'all. So Saturday night, come check us out. We're going to be back on this platform. It's Dr. Lakeisha's birthday, y'all. Oh, Everybody okay. Happy birthday. early birthday. Oh, yeah. Dr. Lakeisha's invited. Everybody, we're having a, my girls are having a virtual birthday party for me. I'm so oh. excited, y'all. 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This you might need it. You might need an IV treatment after that. <laughs> you might need an IV treatment after that. <laughs> I, got a I have no idea what's about to go down, but I do know it's gonna be some bomb music. My homeboy from another mother, DJ Cheech Beats, is gonna be 
ones and twos. So Dr. Daryl, come. Everybody tell your friends. Share the, um, the infogram or whatever we'll have up on the KPMD. But it's Saturday. We're going to party, y'all. Yes. And Dr. Cheech Beats also went to where? The house. The house. Go. Uh, we, we, we everywhere. We are we everywhere. everywhere. We are we, we best life. We're <laughs> living our best life. You can't get away from this. Can't. Can't. You just can't. can't. At least my house family in the building, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Daryl. Thank you, Thank everybody. Thank you so much. Have Thank a you. good night. We'll Y'all have, have a great, have great one. Day. Thank you, Dr. Daryl. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great one. Bye, y'all. Bye. 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 Bye.